some are very different from some <laughs> Vietnam vets that have become very bitter and Cleve has only become better. And it's his attitude of gratitude. Cleve has never complained about what has been taken away because he is so thankful for what he has left. He said, I know this hand's not too pretty to look at, D. I know there are a lot of things I'm unable to do. Young people notice he's taken the word can't out of his vocabulary. He does all he can do. Probably does more with that one hand with two fingers at work than some people do with two strong arms and two good hands. He's not a quitter. He said, honey, just think, when I threw my hands up that night to save my eyes, this arm was immediately traumatically amputated. His left eye completely enucleated. This right hand caught all that burning, searing metal pulling every finger, tendon, and nerve into a clump of burned flesh. But he said, D, just think, this hand, as badly deformed as it is, saved my one eye. But I've got one eye that I can appreciate the beautiful people in this room today and that beautiful creation outside. I remember the doctor that came in to open his hand up to, so that, to try to restore some use of that hand. He tried to save the middle finger, but it died, and he lost the use of that finger. This finger is literally in a cramped position, but the doctor cried when that middle finger did not work. He said, I just wanted that middle finger to work. Cleve said, Doc, I really don't really need that middle finger. If you'll get my trigger finger working so I can shoot another goose with that horn, and you'll make this more real happy. <laughs> So Ed knows we can shoot that gun, and it's amazing. That's an attitude of gratitude, and I thank God for that. Every single day, you got to believe, I'm reminded freedom is not free. Every time I button up his shirt, every time I tie his tie, most especially every time I button up his uniform when he speaks in it, and I lean over to tie his shoes, in a very visible way, every single day, I am reminded, freedom is not free. Amen. So to you, dear Cleve, I write this with pride. For it's men and women like you fighting side by side that make this world a better place to live. But oh, what a price you had to give. From hippies and hippies and draft dodgers too, I'm sure it made fighting lonely and blue. We can't replace your eye or your hand of the miserable days you had in the hospital in Japan. But one day, there will come on this lonely shore our Savior so great who will say, suffer no more. This world will end all its worry, wars, COVID-19, and strife. And we're going to celebrate together our eternal life. My hero, please. My Thank you, baby. You believe that. Yeah. Thank you, Dee. <clears throat> Thank y'all for being here today. Thank y'all for letting us be here. Ed Horner's brother made this possible, and the pastor let us come, and Ed and Doris, two of the best friends we've ever had on earth, and we just thank God for them. And my wife told me to be brief, so I'm going to try to be brief. But uh, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, two weeks ago, we were in um, False Proof, Florida, and last Sunday in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and earlier this week at a naval base in outside of Jacksonville, Florida, Kings Bay, Georgia. And uh, Dee's talking about saving this eye, just to be able to see folks like y'all in this beautiful area. And we've been in all 50 states, but no place is any prettier than this eastern shore of Maryland. No, no people any nicer than y'all are. And thank you so much for letting us be with you today. We love you and thank God for the experience. I know what you're thinking. You see me, you see Deanna, I say, how in the world somebody ugly as you get a wife look like that? <laughs> I was high school football coach 50-something years ago and a married mature leader. You do that today, <laughs> you go straight to jail, I guarantee you. <laughs> well, we got away with it. I thank God for my wife after being wounded seven times in Vietnam, 46 operations, two and a half years in the hospital. So over 600 Marines and sailors come home, arms off, legs off, eyes out. So about 65% of their wives turn their back and walk out on their husbands. My bride's been with me every step of the way. 
And believe me, I thank God each day for it. And I just wish more young men in America could have a wife like her. And I'm happy our daughter is Tara. Krista, we got in with her. She was Miss Clifton a few years ago. She's like a daddy. She couldn't go to school. Stand up. Krista and uh, her daughter. Madeline just finished Davidson with honors, and we're proud of them. Thank y'all for being with us today. But we've been blessed, I guarantee you. Tara married uh, Dan Reeves' his son. Y'all remember Dan, played with the Cowboys, and coached the Broncos, Giants, Falcons. You might want to get him a job. Boy, can't keep a job. But anyway, <laughs> they blessed us with twins. Tara's got, Chris has got twins, Madeline and Redden at 22, and Tara's twins are 20. Daniel and Caroline, and they got a seven-year-old, so we've been blessed in our family. As we travel this country, I think God's Word can very well describe the U.S. of A., United States of Abundance, this great land. We are honored and blessed and privileged to call home. But I think the Lord's talking about a different part of the world here in Deuteronomy chapter 8. If I can keep this Bible open. Deuteronomy 8, 7 through 12. Couldn't this be America? Couldn't be the, this be the USA, the eastern shore of Maryland? For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and plum granites, a land of all olive and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten it at full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given us. Beware that thou forget, beware that, let's see, when thou hast eaten it at full, and, uh, beware that thou hast Forget not the Lord thy God, and not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I commend thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and are full, and have built goodly houses, and dwelt therein, we become too proud and forget the Lord our God. As we travel this great country, we heard full, loud, long, and lasting cries being made throughout America. One group group stood up and said, Cleve, the hope, the answer for America today is learn, learn, learn. Education, they say, is the answer for our country. I believe in education. I taught in coaching junior high school, taught in coaching high school, coaching college. My daughters have taught, my sisters have taught over 40 years in public schools. But you know, I don't believe God's nearly concerned about a person's IQ as much as he is your I will. You go to every school in Maryland, you get so many degrees, they call you Mr. and Ms. Fahrenheit. But if you're not willing to do something with that degree for the glory of God, you're not going to make it. Education alone isn't the answer for our country. The second cry I heard was a group who said, Cleve, the hope, the answer for America is not learn, but earn. Wealth, material things, many say is the answer for our country. I grew up on a 10,000 acre plantation in South Carolina. I used to duck hunt and deer hunt with Tom Yonke to own the Boston Red Sox. Dan and I have been in the home of H.L. Hunt with the richest oil men at Mount Vernon in Dallas, Texas. I've been with Ross Perot. I've hunted with Sam Walton. I've been with the DuPonts, the Dodgers, the Vanderbilts. My granddaddy was caretaker for Bernard Baruch, financial advisor for six presidents. But you know, I've never met the first man that's bought a good wife. That's bought a happy home. That's bought peace. That's bought joy. These are free gifts from the Lord Jesus Christ. Earning wealth, material things aren't the answer for our country. Third cry I heard was on the college campuses. Late 1960s, early 1970s, and folks I hadn't figured out yet why they were there. They couldn't learn anything to refuse to study. They couldn't earn anything to refuse to work. That crowd wouldn't learn, wouldn't earn, what was it? Burn, baby, burn, they marched and chanted. Galatians 6, 7 teaches, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Hosea 8, 7 says, You sow to the wind, you reap a whirlwind. That's what they reaped at Kent State. 
with Bird Baby Bird. I stay with you today. I say it's hope for America today, hope for the world today. It's not learned, not earned. I guarantee it's not burned. There's one hope. It's turn. Turn back to the Word of God. God gave us a promise. Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter, the fourteenth verse. Talking to church people. Talking to folks such as you and I. What did he say? If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, kneel and pray, and seek my face, and turn to you or in, turn from their wicked ways, he promises. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. Let me tell you, if our land ever needed a healing, we need it today, don't we? Amen. Heard about drug problems, alcohol problems, wife abuse, child abuse, abortion. Everybody I know for it's already been born. You notice that? <laughs> we need to turn back to Bible study and prayer. I carry my Bible with me everywhere I go. Somebody said, you don't take it to public school, do you? I said, I sure do. Some atheistic, ungodly lady from Texas took the word out. If we need to put Bibles back in, we need to put it back in for, for the glory of God. I didn't have to go to Vietnam. I was a college coach. About this time of year, September 1966, I saw a young man do something on a college campus. I would pray I never see her get in person. A young man burned the American flag. You heard about a walk on on a college campus? I was a walk off. I went to the coach's office and I'm going to Vietnam, joined the Marines. Had some training in Paris Island and Quantico from there to Vietnam. Like to share with you my last patrol. Had a recon team with a going in there that very few men had been. Instead of going with a six man team, we went in with 13 men. Landed on a small tea plantation in the middle of a large valley. As we landed, we found punchy pits, booby traps, mines, but we're very fortunate. Nobody was killed sitting there on the hill. I cleared a punchy pit, got the bottom of that. Had my radio man, McCormick, dig a foxhole to my left, three men in a foxhole to my right. About 50 yards behind me, a bomb had exploded. Left a big hole, big crater in the ground, and I put eight men around the edges of that bomb crater, thinking it'd have a good bit of protection. About 12 o'clock at night, I thought I heard some enemy movement at the bottom of the hill. I grabbed my shotgun, a Winchester Model 12 pump, crawled out of the punchy pit, started making my way to the right to see if these men had hurt anything. Before I got to them, a grenade came in. It exploded. Hit me in the neck and in the shoulder. And like any other brave lieutenant, I jumped back in a hole and I'd crawl out of. Started calling for artillery and air support opposition. While I was on radio, about 10 or 12 enemy, what we call a sapper unit, norm, better known to y'all probably as a suicide squad. It's like these terrorists they got today. These men had grenades tied around their waist, had grenades in each hand and a pin pull. Just ran up a hill, exploding, killing themselves, trying to kill us. As you can imagine, we were shooting as fast as we could. Wager right in front of me, I shot him. His moment and moment, the hole with me, as he fell in, he had something in his hands, about the size of one of you ladies' pocketbooks. There's a satchel charge, it's full of explosions. He came over this and exploded, blew the two of us out of the punchy pit. I'm going through the air. Reached back from a shotgun, realized the blast had blown my left arm off just above my elbow. Looked to my left, my radio man, McCormick, were dead or unconscious at the time, I wasn't sure which. Heard me screaming in the right crowd, what happened to Gene Kenifox hole? A young Marine, PSC Ralph Johnson. Burke High School, Charleston, South Carolina. Ralph jumped on a grenade, smothered it with his stomach, blew himself in half, saved my life, life of two Marines with him. His family later see the nation's highest award, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Forty years ago, we named the VA hospital in Charleston. It used to be the Charleston VA, it's Ralph H. Johnson now. Ten years ago, we went out and named the street in Charleston after him. 
Two years ago, the Navy named a $4 billion destroyer that's stationed out in Seattle, Washington after him, Ralph H. Johnson. I appreciate that. But that night, I tried to get over to him as I crawled that way. Another grenade came in as I did. I threw my hands up. This arm was off. Right hand covered my right eye. Grenade exploded. Blew my left eye out. Nose off. Teeth on the left side out. Both eardrums out. Lost most of the use of my right hand. Things were looking pretty tough. And I figured my only chance to get in the crater where I had eight men fighting. Tried running for the bomb crater before I got there. Grenade hit me in the legs. I lay there, it seemed like hours. I don't know how long it passed, but believe me, y'all, I never wanted to live, live so bad all my life. If I could just see my men get off that hill alive, if I could see my bride one more time. Heard some movement behind me, I said, it's over now. As got close, I heard something go, Lieutenant, Lieutenant. Recognized a voice, 18 year old Marine ahead from Alaska, he's Indian, Rod Hunter. Rod knelt by my feet, we just picking in the office to come up a hill. Bob Lucas from Fort Worth, Texas got on radio. Bob called for choppers. The pilot said they couldn't get in there till daylight. He said, tell them forget it. We've been throwing rocks on the side of the hill, out of grenades. Why don't anybody be here at daylight? Pilots reconsidered. First bird landed. They put my two dead, five wounded on that chopper as it lifted, the next one landed. The rest of my men just grabbed hold. And that helicopter lifted, about 150 enemy just covered the hill. Five more minutes, probably nobody got out of there alive. They flew us to Marble Mountain, had surgery there, from there to Japan, from there to Bethesda, Maryland. I started walking a little bit. They said, son, your best bet is to go home on leave. Came to my wife's hometown, Florence, South Carolina, and I picked up a newspaper one day. So one of my heroes preaching was gonna be out in the football field that night. Bobby Richardson, former second baseman, New York Yankees. And Laura there in the paper said, Bonnie K. Van Dyke, former Miss America from Arizona. I'm a country boy from South Carolina, but I'm not totally stupid. I turned to my wife and said, I sure like to go see Bobby Richardson. You know, any Marine likes to see Miss America, I said, let's go. Well, we went out. Bobby and Bonnie K got up and shared as I have today. Billy Zioli from President Ford's uh, Muskegon, Michigan, up there. He was chaplain for President Ford. Billy got up that night and brought a message that God used to change our lives. And in his message that night, Billy said, there are two kind of fools in this world, a fool for Christ and a fool for others. He looked out and said, whose fool are you? Whose fool are you? I knew that night whose fool I've been all my life. I never drank, I never smoked, just to let an all fool sports, be an all state in, state champion a mile run, just to impress people. I'd gone to Sunday school and church ever since nine months before I was born. Because that's what mom and dad want me to do. 26 years of my life, every Sunday I'd walk out of church and every Sunday little white, white-headed lady paid me on the back, told me what a fine Christian boy I was. Y'all ever heard that before? You know, told me, so many people told me I was a Christian, I started thinking I was. Dan and I, we had Bible study, prayer, family devotion, ever since we first got married. I impressed her, she impressed me. Let me tell you, God wasn't impressed. We had a whole lot of church, a whole lot of religion in our head. What we needed was a savior in a heart. And that night we came forward and knelt and prayed, confessed our sins in a very personal way. Invited the Lord Jesus to come fill that vacuum in our heart that only he can fill. And we found with the real joy, the real life, the real peace that so many are searching for that comes to that personal relationship with a living Savior. You may think that my men suffered that night on that hill, that I suffered, that my wife has suffered. 47 operations we've been through in two and a half years in a hospital, and you suffered, don't you? Broken home situ situation, a drinking problem, drug problem. A lot of us have had that in family lines. Injury, sickness, illness, 
death in their family, maybe a layoff, a financial struggle. But then and I found that our Bible has become our most prized possession. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5 says, We rejoice in our suffering. Because suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Hope doesn't disappoint us. Because God's love is poured into our hearts as a free gift from the Holy Spirit. In those verses, the word character, and y'all, I believe character is a great word in America today, but I believe it's a misused word. To get into school these days, you got to have a theme, and I go in with a drug and alcohol theme. You say, come on, man, you one of those typical Vietnam vets, you had a drug problem? Let me tell you, I had a serious drug problem. My daddy drugged me to work, <laughs> drugged me to school, drugged me to practice, drugged me to church. I wish more young people had that same daddy. Parents, grandparents, we've meant well, but a lot of us have made a big mistake, have we? What have we done? We try to give our children everything money can buy. You know, I think we ought to give them some things money can't buy. Amen. Honesty. Amen. Integrity. Loyalty. Discipline. Commitment. Manners. Fellas, take that cap off when you come in a building, every building. Stand up when a lady comes in a room. Open a door for a lady. Close the door. Pull a chair out. Pull it back. Girls, let them do it. Amen. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Thank you. God bless you. I love you. Simple words, but important words. When I was in that mass unit, no way I was supposed to live. It's a deathbed situation. You go to church together, work together, go to school together, you get close. You fight together behind enemy lines, you get close too. And two dead, 11 wounded out of 13. But my men that could physically walk came by that mass unit one at a time just to get a last look. Just to tell me bye. I started to say they were crying, but you know Marines, man, we tough. We don't cry, but the eyeballs were sweating pretty good. <laughs> and they lay a plaque down by me, and on that plaque it said, In this world of give and take, there are not enough people willing to give what it takes. What an honor to be here today with folks like you with the leadership that you have. Preparing yourself mentally, physically, spiritually. Willing to give what it takes for faith, for flag, for families, you veterans, our freedom, you young people, our future. The way of life we know and enjoy so well because of great folks like you. In closing, I'd like to use the illustration of a baseball game. And I love to use a baseball diamond as the illustration for your life because you are a diamond. You're precious. And as you look at that diamond of your life, let's let first base that diamond, first base your life, be salvation. God's Word teaches you must be born again. A personal relationship with a living Savior. And let's let second base your Life be church membership. And as I travel our country, I see some people lose interest in the church. But remember what the Lord Jesus called the church? He called it his bride. His bride. I like that. You can talk about this shot up marine all you want to. You can talk about a daughter, it's Terry and Krista. You talk about our five grandchildren. You talk about my bride and my fight you. And I think that's the way we should build our church. God wants you in that second base of a Bible believing in preaching church. Just being baptized. Just being obedient to the Word of God. Third base, your life is service. We got some veterans that have served that country a lot longer and a lot better than I have. But yeah, I think it's time now that we serve the Lord. Teach Sunday school. Sing the choir. Go out on visitation. Give to missions. Give your time, your talents. The, the Lord Jesus Christ. That third base of service is exciting. And home plenty of life is heaven. If the Bible promises I go to prepare a place for you, that special place is heaven. 
1924, the World Series was played. Washington and New York played a 24 series. Washington won three games, New York won three games. Seventh game, the ninth inning, two outs in the ninth, score was tied. You can imagine tension, excitement. Last game, last out, World Series. New York pitcher wound up, he delivered. Goose Goslin, one league in of Washington, Lee Starford, Detroit was at bat. Pitch came in, Gotham was left-handed, he swung, he connected, ball went out left center the field, looked like his fourth home run, but instead of clearing the fifth, Gotham drives, hits the side of the wall, and bounced back on the playing field. Goose Gotham ran it first, headed for second, ran it second, headed for third. By this time, left field played the ball, the ricochet off the wall, he feel it, he turned, he threw for home with everything he had. Gotham was cutting that third base line, Throw was coming in left field. Everyone from Washington was standing. Everyone from New York was standing. They knew it was going to be close at home. But as the throw came in, Peg was high. Catching New York had a stretch way up as he reached to get it. Gosling slid under it. Everybody see. Throw was high. Tag was late. Gosling was safe at home. Crowd went wild. Hollering, yelling, running in the field, ripping up the bases. But as they got their whole plate, is that dust still there at home? That fellow behind the plate that his fist up near screaming, you're out, you're out. Kill that umpire. <laughs> Blind him up. Everybody see throw was high, tag had been late. How in the world could he call him out at home plate? Umpire grabbed the megaphone. He turned, he faced the crowd, came down celebrating. All of a sudden wanted to kill him. He says, I've called the base runner out because he never touched first base. He failed a tag first base. You look at that diamond of your life today. Do you know for sure? Are you certain? Have you stepped on first base? One day we'll all around third base of life. You go sliding home, the umpire's gonna look at you and say, Safe, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into thy reward. But one day you go sliding home, the dust of your life's gonna settle. The umpire can be standing over you with his fist up near screaming, You're out. You're out. You go brush yourself off and jump up and say, Why me, Lord? How can I be out? I did this, I didn't do that. I was better than that guy. He's going to look at you and reply with the saddest words in the Bible. And say, depart from me, because I didn't know you. I never knew you. Are you grew up in America singing, faith of our fathers, God bless America. God doesn't have a family plan. Our parents, our grandparents can be tremendous Christians. But there's never been, there never will be a grandchild of God. Your child of God or you're lost. You overran. You failed to tag. You missed that first base. Let us bow in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every heart lifted. As you look at that baseball diamond of your life today, you may say, Cleve, I've never heard it quite like this. I never looked at my life as a baseball game, as a baseball diamond, but as I do today, Cleve, I need to replay that game. And I want to make sure today I touch that first base. Cleve, I want you to pray for me. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. Would you slip your hand up with me? Say, Cleve, pray for me. I need to touch first base. I want to do it today. You may have raised your hand, you may not have raised your hand, but in your heart, just between you and the Lord, you may want a prayer, a prayer like this. Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a son of because your word teaches we've all sinned and come short of your glory. The wages of sin is death. But the good news is we can have eternal life through Christ Jesus. Father, this day in September, I want to replay that ball game of my life. Today, Lord, I confess my sins to you. Ask you to forgive me of my sins and invite you in a very personal way to come dwell in my heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me and help me, Lord to live for you. In thy name we pray and to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Preacher, you'll come.